I think it was like, what was so interesting in that the lessons three and four of the course is it was like really big struggle. I think you see a lot of me failing and, and going back and trying to fix things. And I think that's kind of like uh, also like nice for someone taking the course to see um, what adjustments are being made uh, because not everything, not all the time it's, it's so fluid. Uh, sometimes it goes a lot more smooth, but I think that portrait took ages, uh, months of like letting it sit for a little while and coming back to it. I, I mean, it was something that I'd work on, not all, like full time, but uh, yeah, it was a, a slow process, but I think it's nice to kind of see the, the thought process I have and what needs to be fixed. The human face is considered to be one of the most difficult subjects to draw or paint. But difficult does not mean impossible. And our next guest is proof of that. The brilliant Daniel Walsh is a creative of many talents and many faces, in the portrait sense that is. And in this episode, discover how he developed the necessary skills to create striking portraits and how he's been able to teach you the same thing in his Timeless Learn Squared course, Painting Portraits, which is available now. So buckle up, don't forget to follow, like, subscribe and all of that good stuff. Then let's go. Let's, let's do this. Um, Sweet. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Learn Squared podcast and I'm delighted to have on today's guest, uh, Daniel Walsh. If you're not familiar with Daniel, um, or you probably are, um, there's a few reasons why, mainly because he's a badass artist and also because he is the instructor of our recently released painting portraits course. Um, but enough of me butchering Daniel's into, uh, intro, um, I'll hand it over to him to, uh, I guess, introduce himself and just give us a lowdown of who he is. Cool. Oh, thanks for the introduction. <laughs> no worries. Um, super nice to be invited to do a course with Learn Squared. Um, I know Mo got in contact with me, maybe it was three years ago, wow. firstly, and I couldn't do it the first time. Um, and then now uh, I took up that that invitation and it's really cool. Uh, but that was, that was still a while ago. It took a long time to do the course. Um, but yeah, so I'm, uh, working as a concept artist at the moment and I have a traditional background. I, I actually am from Sydney, Australia originally, but I have uh, my mother's Swedish and my, my father's American. So I moved over to Sweden when I was 20 and started studying at, uh, like a Swedish, the Swedish Academy of Realist Art. It's like an atelier school which is really classical art so it's uh no digital only traditional mediums and it's a lot of like figure drawing like life drawing and and uh cast drawing which is like statues mm -hmm. uh, and it was a very intensive course so it was like five days a week and i did it for two years wow. so it was super cool experience i actually found that uh school through uh, like a forum thread on conceptart.org oh, really? yeah cool. a while ago so and it was recommended so i I studied there for two years and I was awesome. Uh, after doing that, I started getting a little bit of work doing illustration. So a few gigs like book covers, uh, that kind of stuff. And then it eventually led into like more um, like real jobs, working with Warhammer and uh, some of the publications as well as uh, doing one book for Lucasfilm, which is really cool. cool. Um, and those would come sort of every now and then. Uh, and then I had, sort of a job on the side just a, a normal job on the side I actually worked at a, at a climbing center in cool. Stockholm for a long time so I was yeah doing that and then working in illustration and yeah now I work as a concept artist which is really fun and it's full-time and just really enjoying it yes yeah, so I guess it's the... been like a at least professionally it's been like I would you say it's like a mixture of freelance and full-time or was it kind of like all of those things intertwined yeah like freelance and the beginning mm -hmm. and uh so it would become, become some of the work would come sort of for like i'd have like a month of work and then there might be a few months off from work and uh, so that's why i started looking for something that was more mm -hmm. full-time eventually but i you know i uh, was pretty slow getting work and and now i'm 32 and i've been in the concept art industry for only was it basically three na three years now so mm -hmm. pretty late to get get started um but uh, it feels it's uh, awesome to uh, you know I I wake up every every morning and I really look forward to starting the day at work. So yeah, it's really fun. It is 
a cool job. Like, uh, and um, I'm sure that's one of the reasons why you pursued it because it's something you clearly wanted to do. Um, I guess, like, when did that kind of that kind of like epiphany begin for you, or like that moment where you think, "Hey, I want to do this as a living," um, or is it something that maybe wasn't necessarily on the career path, but something that you kind of discovered later on? Like, yeah, how did that work out for you? Yeah, I guess um, it began like I, I originally did graphic design for about a year just after high school at a school in Sydney, and we had a teacher there that actually it was it was a really good course because the first month of the course was only drawing, which I think is pretty interesting for graphic design. Uh, well, it was maybe the, not a full month, but basically two week workshop, of just like drawing like an an apple realistically with uh, like nice lighting. And we had a we had a teacher that had worked in a game studio actually come in and instruct that course. So I think I took that away after the course and was like, well, I found that pretty interesting. Um, so that as well as I had like a friend in high school that was also drawing quite a bit. He would paint a lot of Warhammer, like the miniatures, and then he got into drawing and he kind of gave me some instruction to take, like I would take like an image of a portrait and he was like just boost the contrast and like take, put it on your computer, that image or find one on the computer and like boost the contrast in Photoshop, just like make it almost like a black and white photo Mm -hmm. and uh, just draw the shadow shapes and don't really think of like an eye or the nose, just think of the shape and how that looks. And then something clicks in my head and I realized my drawings got a lot better from just thinking that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I started drawing for like a year this is about, I was about 21 or so. And then it, I kind of lost interest after that. And then I went to Sweden and I was just there actually on a holiday, but decided to stay long. Um, and then I bumped into, I think I was just online and I bumped into Feng Zhu's tutorials, who's, uh, don't know if I'm pronouncing his name name right, but he has like a, a bunch of uh, free tutorials on, on YouTube and on his website. And I just got really into those. And then from there I just kind of drew it every day and I wasn't really progressing so fast. And then I went on concept.org and found that there was a school in Sweden. So yeah, that's where it kind of, that's where I wanted to like pursue it as a career, probably when I was over in Sweden at about 22, 23. So yeah, just moving away from graphic design, I thought it was more interesting in concept and uh, yeah. Uh, it's cool like it's mixed with a lot of the digital and the traditional as well. Um, like my journey has been a little bit similar in terms of being exposed to the traditional well but after high school and college it was purely traditional and then kind of like towards the end of it the digital stuff started coming in like photoshop and then obviously you know you realize all these different tools that are available and fast forward till today like you know compared to yeah. how they were like maybe 10 15 years ago it, it's insane but um yeah like I, I get like but i guess what i'm trying to say is like i fully appreciate and understand the appeal of like and even the value of i guess working in different mediums, not just only in terms of to get a finished result, but kind of like, I guess, understanding how they work. And like you mentioned, like how they influence, I guess, your final result in terms of, because um, like you mentioned before, when you switch to um, shapes versus how you were doing it before, and it's like something clicked, um, Mm. would you say like it's advantage to kind of like try maybe different mediums or even switch things up just to make those breakthroughs? Yeah, I guess uh, trying different mediums, kind of, uh, especially just using graphite and pencil, kind of slows you down as well. When you can, you have a little bit of a slower thought process. Uh, you have time to uh, think while you're putting the pencil to paper. Whereas in Photoshop, it's a lot like very. I, I know that I'm a little bit more um, fast paced, and my energy levels are higher when I'm using <laughs> Photoshop. Um, I don't know if you feel the same as well. Like if you work traditionally, you kind of slow down a little bit, so a little bit more. Uh, yeah. A little bit more like yeah. relaxing to work. Yeah, in, I'd love in a way. F- for sure. And I think sometimes it's meditative. more economical because I don't want to waste my pages. So I think I'm like, yeah, you know, I've got to make well. sure this is cool. Um, otherwise, yeah. I can't undo this and add an extra layer and et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, yeah, I actually didn't think of it that way, but that's definitely um, 100% a factor. Which one do you prefer? Is there like, I guess, is it even the right question? Because is it even a preference? Yeah, I can, I think it changes. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I like both. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. Like sometimes there's there's periods where I prefer working digitally, and then sometimes I'll uh, like really for personal work, I want to try to work traditionally. But I haven't done it. I haven't done much traditional work in the last uh, what 
four or five months probably, but mm-hmm. that might be because I've been moving around a little bit. Right, so right. it's a little bit harder to set up. Usually I'll try to work in oils or do like an oil painting portrait. Yeah. Um, one thing with the mediums about oils though, is like you, uh, it's, it's like you want to, you're trying to, um, sort of save your paints is not is not a good thing so you don't want to be so economical with your paints you want to try to use as much much paint as you can which is a so that's another thing um to think of is uh don't let it that that hinder your your process uh, especially with oils but with graphite it's different like you want to try to save the paper not make mistakes and stuff but yeah and like do you would you say like are you quite maybe rigid is not the wrong word but are you quite rigid in terms of ensuring that you do a lot some time to do traditional and digital or whatever you do or is it completely i guess like fluid and whenever it happens it kind of happens as long as you kind of get to i guess flex that creative muscle yeah um i guess it's more of like a the i'm trying to think with the yeah, it's probably mainly based on on the situation and my, my setup mm-hmm. as well. Uh, if I'm at, if I've got my studio set up for for painting, um, I I get yeah I get into sort of like a, a I try to do a routine, so I try to go to live drawing once a week at least, uh, and that gets me away from the computer as well. And I also after a while I start to. Th- um, be conscious that I'm not doing anything traditional. So I try to just make yeah. sure I'm at least doing uh, live drawing or, and, th- and that's a nice way you feel very productive there. Cause you get a lot of drawings out in a short amount of time. And usually those, I go to like a, a local live drawing uh, place just down the road and they do, I think the maximum pose is like a 20 minute pose and the minimum is a two minute pose. So you might get about, uh, yeah, 20 drawings or so done in, in the night. So yeah, it's uh, it feels productive. And what is it, I guess, like about? I guess they mentioned life drawing there. Like, what is it about life drawing and doing that routinely? Um, is something that's important for you? Like, why, why, why is it something that you want to continue doing and almost like, yeah, ritualistically even? Yeah, I wonder that as well. Um, I think it has a lot to do with something. It's good practice to draw the human figure. I think it's like the very difficult thing to draw. Uh, and then also doing it traditionally, it feels like that's when I'm, for instance, like going to the gym to train, but it's for the drawing. So I think it, yeah, really seemed to, the next day I, I tend to draw a little better, I think, mm-hmm. or just after a live drawing session, it's kind of like I'm warmed up properly. Yeah, You know, I probably get that from doing concept. That's why I really like hopping into concept and hopping away from illustration because you, you're kind of uh, making these fast-paced sketches and it uh, broke me away from being really particular with my my paintings mm-hmm. from being at the classical art school it was you would spend like a minimum a week on a piece so wow. it was just nice to move on to something where you're trying to do like five or six sketches yeah. in a day or something like that yeah that's something that's that um i've kind of noticed as well like um i hardly do much traditional in terms of like painting and stuff i sometimes do it with my daughter like as just just you know just like almost as a form of play um because she's very like crafts and creative and stuff like that as well but normally for me the most traditional i get is just sketching either on paper or pencil or whatever um but at the same time like i can relate like there's something about i wouldn't yeah kind of like impatient sometimes like trying to take a long time on something and it's something that i definitely want to change um but i've noticed that if i can do something quick i guess maybe quick's the wrong word because it's not about speed but there's something about you get to your result that you're looking at in a much faster pace than if you were doing it traditionally but at the same time um you know like with whatever tool i've got like whether it's antique or a tablet or whatever nothing feels better than you know pen paper or whatever else as well um but but it's interesting as well because they both yield like different results and like you you Mm -hmm. alluded to that as well because i guess it's probably just how it affects your your mind and everything um and you know like i guess not to go maybe too deep on this kind of stuff because i clearly not qualified on this um about the terminologies or whatever but like do you kind of think a lot about the psychology of like how you are as an artist and I guess your 
psychological mental makeup and how that influences art and stuff is that something that you dwell upon yeah oh yeah definitely i definitely think about it in my process um think that i've i've become a little bit more uh confident in my in my ability uh recently but yeah breaking away from that atelier uh it's like it almost hindered me in a way to to work in in concept it was very right. very difficult in the beginning uh and just being able to make pieces consistently and failing is also another mm-hmm. thing like learn to fail and and make bad paintings or bad drawings uh, i think that's also important um i don't know how do you how do you go about that as well are you conscious of that stuff a lot when you're when you're drawing as well uh for... i don't know it's like it's more some of the things than afterthought but like i guess it just just pops in and i'm just thinking you know i guess it's like a very abstract kind of thought or idea or kind of conclusion but it's maybe difficult to kind of put into kind of words um mm-hmm. but a lot of it is just kind of thinking or my my thing maybe is more like product something triggers it so something like product maybe productivity related or maybe the results not great or there's something that is not hitting maybe a target that I'm looking for um or just to a kind of maybe a look or a vibe or just just something that kind of reaches that level of maybe satisfaction we could say um mm-hmm. and then it's kind of kind of decoding what it is is it a case of like well one thing I've kind of have noticed is you mentioned about getting away from the computer is after so many years of like what well, to the point where I've got my, earned myself some chronic pain that was a nice reward I got from mm. it um but like you know just lurched over with um what I'm going to jump around a little bit now um yeah. but like I've seen a physiotherapist and one thing that has kind of like optimized a little bit is the quote unquote injury that I have or the condition that I have is almost aligned with maybe like an athlete who's rep- like a like a bowler or uh, something like that where they repetitively use a limb at an extreme level um you know um it's kind of like that so clearly there's like factors of like you know work involved into it and things like that as well so being away from that kind of zone being away from that kind of space and still being able to create um felt great because I wasn't in that position which kind of led to pain and sometimes you know like being because I don't have a laptop I got a tablet but um I don't have a laptop or anything um purely because of the GPUs and all that kind of stuff and it's nice not to be kind of wired in so then kind of looking back and thinking hey okay is there something to that like okay it's affected me how I maybe work or achieve results because maybe I'm not happy in a particular environment and kind of looking at it in that way um and then yeah there's like a list of other things as well where maybe it's just you know fill in the blanks kind of thing i guess and you can put any scenario in that situation um and it's like one of the things as well was kind of like looking a lot into i guess people who are like really top level and like high end and whatever they do whether it's uh, athletes are a great one because i guess more so because there's a lot more information on them a lot more documentation on them um and uh, i'm i'm big into like formula 1 and Lewis Hamilton I'm sure you're familiar with him like he's his statistics alone the greatest driver um mm-hmm. obviously a lot so sports is something you can debate a lot about whether someone's great or not but then a lot of it is always like looking back into it like he's always been a quote unquote talent which is basically like a simplified way of saying someone who's just everything kind of clicks when they do a task so he's always been good he's always been great he seemed to have a lot of natural ability but then like looking into like his you know read between the lines cuz a lot of the stuff you see like in mainstream I guess kind of like sports writing and stuff is just the standard cookie cutter stuff right it's just there to like get clicks or whatever so you kind of got to read between the lines look into interviews etc to really see like what makes this person tick and then seeing guys kind of done like these life hacks or psychology hacks or like trying to like zone in and all these other little things where you think hey you don't need to kind of like do that um but you clearly you're doing it like you've just started and you haven't achieved anything um and then even the um, the Michael Jordan documentary is it the last dance i'm sure you probably seen that on netflix yeah 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 it was yeah. a while ago now but yeah it's so. like a similar kind of person where it's just this centered focus and then all these little things that kind of contribute into that so mm-hmm. yeah i don't know if that answers the case kind of what you mentioned but it's kind of like and this is the kind of part I was making where it's like kind of very abstract because it's 
at least for me, hard to pinpoint exactly what it is. But it's something I find myself dreading more and more and also realize the fact that like I mentioned being away from my computer being away from I guess my regular way of making art almost being away from making art is kind mm. of helping me um and just to put that to yourself is that something oh you kind of mentioned it like being away from computer doing the life drawing classes and stuff but even away from art in general do you find kind of switching off is helpful or even useful yeah, I think lately, since I like when since I moved here, I was not so balanced when I was over in Denmark. I lived in Denmark uh, last year, and I had a laptop with me, and like I always, plus the apartment that we were in were pretty small, so I had my workspace in the living room, and I was like, it was hard to switch off because I'd leave the computer on, and then I would mm -hmm. look at like an update which would come in late. I'd get some feedback on a piece or something, and when I moved back to Australia uh, at the beginning of um, well, what was it like a few months ago? Anyway, um, it, I just made sure like I kept now my office space is separate from where I where I'm living, so uh, it's kind of nice to to be able to take a break. Actually, mm -hmm. lock the the door and yeah. turn the computer off, and just usually leave it. And then I also uh, I spend actually time just hanging out and and watching movies is a good mm -hmm. thing. Maybe it's kind of to get inspiration for uh, for concept art or art, the artwork that I'm. I'm working on uh it's just a different way of absorbing information that might be useful but it's not art really art related mm -hmm. it's a little bit more leisure time so i try to pick like a good film to watch uh that's a that's a good one and then also uh, i just got really into surfing in the last year like i'm obsessed with it so oh, wow. that's another thing that i that i'm doing that i'm it's very humbling because it's a very difficult sport but uh yeah it's those, those are the two things and i hang out of course with my partner and she likes the balance as well yeah, so yeah we got a puppy just recently, oh, so nice, nice. we're just taking care of taking care of it. So I get excited to get off the computer as well. And yes, yeah. surfing. Um, I like swimming. Um, although the yeah. chronic pain has really hindered that. Um, but I like doing it in, indoors in a pool where there's a lifeguard and stuff, and um, that can save yeah. me if I do drown. Um, surfing sounds cool, but sharks kind of scare me. Um, but like, how how is how did you pick up surfing? I guess it's like you know a very kind of like not to be stereotypical, but like a Aussie thing. Um, yeah, but, thing, yeah, how did you kind of get into surfing and why especially in this area uh, oh, right, okay. I live on like the northern beaches so every, all the kids there's all these little what they call it grommets little right. kids that are like pro surfers and it makes you look <laughs> really really bad they're all really good um, yeah so we, we live pretty close to the beach here and I wasn't too into it as a kid growing up in high school but uh, when I moved to New Zealand and worked uh, that was my first concept art job over there uh, yes. I was uh, near a beach next to the airport called Lyle Bay, which is pretty close to the Wellington, central Wellington city. And it just was like, I just looked really nice to go surfing. So I rented nice. a board and, and went out and then I, for some reason, had a really good good time. So I got obsessed from then. So, yeah. But How how good um, are you? Like how, oh, sorry, well, I guess the better question is, how easy is to come out and pick up? Yeah, I, I, like... I feel like it's super difficult. I'm not really a board sports person. Uh, right. Like I, I also do bouldering, which is really popular these days. I've been mm -hmm. doing that for a long time. I feel like I picked that up very naturally compared to this. Surfing is really difficult. I'm like, well, I've probably been surfing now two years. And then even as a kid, maybe another year and a half or so. And then still don't, uh, what well, I'm still like an intermediate level sort of, mm. yeah. Okay. I can get up. I can ride the wave. I can maybe turn a little bit, but that's, uh, on my forehand, on my uh, backhand, not so much. Like if you're going, uh, if I'm going like left on the wave, right. then I can surf it pretty well. But if I'm going right on the wave, not as well because I'm a goofy footer. So. <laughs> and I guess is this like a hobby for life now, or is it something that you maybe like stop doing? I guess I guess unless you move to the mountains or something when you can't do it. Yeah, um, I think so. As long as yeah, we live around this area. <laughs> I did actually a little bit of surfing in Denmark. There's a little bit of surf on the west coast. Nice. It's very cold, but uh, yeah. Um, you, men you mentioned uh, movies. What was the last kind of like, uh, like, and it's a cool topic as well because, like, with creatives, I've, I've found like it's it, inspiration or even like your creative mind like, is always kind of like active. Like, it's maybe goes on like power saving mode, but it's always like kind of running in the background and you kind of really can never turn it off. And if you do, it's kind of like a blissful moment because thinking, hey, I'd, you know, like kind of switched off maybe. Um, but like, yeah, what's the last inspirational thing that you watched? Uh, well, I'm watching a lot of war movies at the moment. Um, 
I watch Zero Dark Thirty. Okay. And yeah, just because it's sort of something that I've been looking at uh, mm-hmm. those those films um, just recently, uh, probably to do with the projects I'm working on. Cool. Um, what was the other one that I watched? Extraction, which is like a Netflix. I don't know how good that one is. Pretty fun action film okay. with uh, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, trying to think. Um, yeah, just those two recently. Otherwise, a lot of trash TV as well, which is just leisure <laughs> stuff. But um, yeah, even when I'm watching those movies, though, there's a lot of times when my brain's just switching off. I'm not thinking so artistically. Ah, I'm just okay, enjoying yeah. it. But there might be a scene here or there with like the some sort of feel or atmosphere. I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. So... Yeah, probably we've all, we've all kind of like we've all kind of like got that f- type of I guess film movie or whatever it is. It's kind of like a go to for like this is what I think is like you know top level either art or creativity or inspirational. Like this is what it is. Like this is the truth kind of thing. Um, do you have any of those? Uh, I think well, I've... I really liked. I guess these are. I really liked Interstellar. I love that film. So I also really liked Arcane, the series, of course. I think everyone really liked uh, the style um, in in that series, Arcane. And... I haven't seen that yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it depends. Uh, I don't actually watch a lot of anime, uh, mm-hmm. but that one, you know, it's sort of uh, has some sort of influences, but uh, I really enjoyed that. It's really cool. Uh, what else is there? That I really liked recently. Um, yeah, Into the Sp- Spider Verse was cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, like, what about classics? Even classics. Yeah, man. Um, as a kid, Jurassic Park was probably my favorite. Jurassic Park and Shrek. Same, same. Yeah, really not so much Shrek, um, but yeah, Jurassic so Park for Shrek. sure. For sure, Jurassic Park. Yeah, yeah Shrek's so good though. Shrek, Shrek's iconic. Yeah. Yeah, there's just something uh, so nice about Shrek. It is very iconic. Um, yeah. I remember watching that a lot as a kid. On I, I think my kid watching it like a thousand times kind of definitely dropped the value on it a little, a little bit for me. Um, yeah. Like to the point where I kind of almost know it word for word. Um, oh, yeah, okay. But but like, yeah, Jurassic Park is, I could talk all day about Jurassic Park. It's yeah. that, That's how like, it is probably the greatest thing I've ever seen like, in terms of the age and impact and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but even to, taking my own personal stuff away from it it is just like a very close to perf- perfect movie at least in mm-hmm. the hollywood sense i'd say there's uh that scene oh, the one that scared me so much was when he's uh i forgot that i actually forgot the name of the, the characters where it's the, the guy that drives he gets stuck down a like a ravine in a river and then there's that uh oh, just where the dennis um, nedry is that his name is that yeah no, he's like the, the it guy yeah and then that um the dinosaur with the so like frilled neck comes out and spits in his face. It's uh, that Gallimimus, I think they called it, but apparently it doesn't uh, do that. Okay. It always never did that. It's just something yeah. made up for the film. But I'm yeah, glad they did because that was a cool scene. It was cool. It's always very scary. Yeah, yeah it's it, a great, great film. Um, this is super spoiler, but if you haven't seen Jurassic Park, um, shame on you. Um, but like it was cool because you could clearly see that he needed to get destroyed or killed by a dinosaur and it's kind of like building up and like he was escaping and did all these things and sabotaged the whole <laughs> thing and then it was a good death because yeah. he disrespected the dinosaur and then um, yeah he got dealt with afterwards uh, that's true that's true <laughs> yeah 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 uh, portraits so yeah. when did the specialty kind of come in portraits it's interesting that you kind of mentioned earlier as well that it's you've only started to feel kind of more um, sorry from paraphrasing here but like more happier or kind of like yeah i guess it's like more accepting of your work which is interesting to hear because looking at it it's such a high level and so astonishing it's it's quite um sobering to always kind of like hear when people describe the work in that way when clearly it's like at least from my perspective and i'm sure everyone agrees as well like it's it's like amazing um but yeah like you mentioned also that the human body and human form is and i'm I'm sure there is nothing else that's more difficult to draw and capture and even like you know like make it appealing as well so why pick this such a difficult topic like that this kind of like theme oh i think when i'm like uh Doing personal work was really difficult. So like I could do like a study from a photo or I could 
paint someone from real life, which I know is definitely like a skill. Uh, I just really wanted to progress in making uh, sort of things from imagination and using those techniques I learned and, and creating things that are, yeah, not not like in real life making environments or characters that are mm-hmm. based on references and not directly copying. I think that was uh, where I've kind of learned a lot in the last three years or so doing concept art. Mm-hmm. Um, portraits are probably because, I, I mean, I love doing portraits and that might be something that's just I've learned from being at the Atelier. We mm-hmm. did a lot of portrait drawing as well. And I guess there's something um, I got, sort of familiar with and then like I sort of as I got a little better at it I kind of enjoyed it a lot more and understanding the forms of the face and getting the shapes and the volume of the head and Mm -hmm. the facial features and all that it's just very satisfying Uh, and maybe that subject is just something that I'm sort of like comfortable with so Mm -hmm. kind of stuck to it Uh, I thought that's why it would be really good to do the course on, Mm -hmm. on that as well and I also think that it really helps my characters even in concept and in illustration to I know that uh, I can get really good expression uh, on the character from having that like quite, quite uh, like structured and, and like good uh, portrait. And usually I kind of start in that area and I work yeah. sort of down the character as well. Um, like once I've done the thumbnail, I kind of mm-hmm. work on the face a little bit and then I'm kind of happy with the drawing. I'm like um, kind of inspired to continue on. And then I work sort of throughout the whole character and try to bring everything up to the same level. So yeah, uh, I think, um, it's just a nice uh, sort of subject to pick for the, the course. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of like you don't want to bring in too many different elements. And I think if you can kind of pick one subject, you, it's going to help you in like other parts of your drawing, whether it's the rest of the body or the hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, hands are Maybe hands are a little bit, hands and feet are probably a bit of a different, right, right. Uh, a different thing. They're actually very complicated uh and, and they're also almost or pretty much just as important as, uh-huh. as the face as well so there's a lot of expression in them um particularly the hands but uh, i think yeah it's just a nice to sit on one subject and pick that and, and learn to draw that and then maybe you can take some of those techniques apply it to the rest of the drawing and um <clears throat> like how difficult was it or what was it was it challenging to kind of grasp portraits when you were developing your skills initially um or was it something that kind of like because you mentioned that you enjoy doing it and it's like your favorite favorite kind of topic um but was it challenging to kind of get to the level that you're at and if so what kind of things were really like tripping you up um whilst you were leveling up yeah it definitely it was definitely difficult um what was tripping me up was probably moving away from the line drawing too fast, Mm -hmm. not getting the structure down. Uh, And then I think once you you give yourself enough time to have done enough drawings and fails enough, you start as, I guess you're trying to like, sort of like interpret what you're seeing and put that down on paper. Sometimes it's hard to like, know where you want to put a line to indicate something like Mm. whether it's in the hairline or if it's like where the shadow is below the hairline um and and obviously you're going to sort of like develop your own style and thought process and i think that just takes a little bit to get to get used to Mm -hmm. uh and now i can kind of look at a face sometimes and and sort of like can kind of imagine it as a drawing before i've drawn it in a way i think that's something that's uh just comes after a while Uh, I know there's certain subjects I think you know if I'm doing like a plain air painting I find that quite difficult because I'm not really sure where I want the values to to, like my value range and I just probably just haven't had enough uh, experience in doing plain airs Uh Uh, so I I find it difficult it's a good good challenge to do to try to do sometimes but um yeah it's uh I guess you kind of familiarize yourself with the subject and you can understand it a little better when you put it down on paper. Do you, do you also get that as well? Like I think you do a lot of um, uh, like hard surface sort of drawing, like vehicle stuff. Um, maybe with yeah, portraiture, yeah. you probably feel a little bit, it's a bit more organic. I'm not sure how. Um, like portraiture for sure is, and I've taken the course as well, like I'm on the first couple of lessons, seeing how you decode the face like 
that was really eye opening no pun intended um because it was um and like it's it's funny because watching like you know my my kids drawing stuff obviously they're super young but like how you understand the face we we saw like outlines right like sort of like the the overall shape and then you put the features and that's it and especially like with um my background which is like through industrial design so a lot of it was all like you know construction lines and thinking of the volume and stuff which is cool um but whenever i did faces they always ended up looking like either the same or looking very like almost like a product sketch as opposed to really capturing you know like someone's likeness and almost like like for me and this was see with your work like a great portrait is you don't you don't see that hey that's a cool if they see a painting you don't see hey that's a cool painting you're mesmerized or you're captured into whatever you're looking at um but at the same time it's like with when i'm doing hard surfaces or whatever it is kind of the same things thinking about shape and then aligning them together or putting them in a certain place or kind of finding that kind of harmony and then versus whatever your kind of overall goal is and then you know kind of like massaging you all into place to kind of make it fit and then i i'll definitely say i'm like and this is a by choice as well but also i think what i've learned about myself i'm definitely like a rough around the edges like more of those like rustic kind of way i like to do things and kind of like the finish um so which is cool um but at the same time like it was really eye opening to and it's interesting because even though i've yet to do a finished portrait was starting the course i've already started using certain things in my own sketches just like you know even thinking even deeper like although you wear things like proportion and you know like forms and shape and everything just thinking even deeper on that level to try and like really fine tune it and really kind of like and kind of back to that Lewis Hamilton example where it was kind of like almost understanding like okay why go even deeper when you kind of reached maybe a more satisfactory level um like why go even further and that's kind of like kind of answered that a little bit um mm-hmm. But yeah, like like even touching upon the course, it's really interesting because as of the things I mentioned, it's I've always found it like intimidating because I never really found a workflow to kind of really do it. Like I've I've done obviously like anyone who's like taken art school or whatever, they've always you've always done at least a single lesson, if not many, where you've had to draw somebody, and you know you kind of can figure it out. A lot of the time, it's like a photocopy of what you've seen, and it's like hey, this is cool, but it's different from doing an actual portrait or even a concept from scratch where there's nothing to copy off and mm. therefore I've always thought that okay this is very like high level for me so I kind of need to I was skirted around it um or you know just hacked it in a way like you know with photo bashing or whatever else as well um but then the way like the bog method in particular is so ingenious because of how simple it is and like how quickly you realize the construction of forms in the in the human face and and like the relation to each other and really breaking down the shape and the shapes within the shape and how they connect and stuff um so like you know with the course itself how was it because you mentioned obviously it was a long journey to get the course to come to fruition as well and i'm sure there's many factors in that but in terms of like coming up with what to teach and if anyone hasn't checked out the course yet check it out the first lesson's free um the end results are amazing just look at the student gallery and see what people are doing so far already and it's interesting because a lot of people have not taken portraits at all and this is their first time doing it and the results are stunning and they speak for themselves but how was it like coming up with that curriculum kind of figuring out what are the best steps to teach people to decode faces and how to draw them and be expressive with how they bring them to life yeah uh Yeah the the Charles Bog method is really cool because it, it kind of um I guess it slows you down a little bit and it really breaks it like really simplifies it. It also builds your patience a little bit. They're yeah. actually kind of boring to do, but I think they're really really helpful. I know when we well it's like a the Charles Bog method is like a real traditional mm-hmm. uh method that we would use at the school when you you would tend to do it only with like pencil and graphite. Or, or charcoal and paper you wouldn't really do it digitally so i wasn't really sure if it was going to work too well mm-hmm. uh you can choose either way like you can do it traditionally or digitally from the course but um yeah essentially it works the same and um i i just what i thought it was like 
it's almost like you're just copying something directly and in a way you can sort of begin with the very start by just sort of like understanding the movement of your hand with the pen uh mm -hmm. instead of like trying to draw an eye and then shade it it's like you're just making it as simple as possible and then copying something directly and the drawing that you're copying is really basic as well but you want to copy it exactly the same uh, whether it takes you a few hours to do just like a simple uh, line drawing of an eye uh, and I think that way you you can see the achievement of being like wow I did draw just like I drew an eye and it looks good it looks exactly like what the plate is and then the plate like the the plate being the drawing that you're copying uh, it becomes a little bit more complex it's like a nice progression uh, like it doesn't introduce like it introduces like just very structured lines and then there's a little bit more like lines with fidelity in the more advanced plate and then the next plate up is a little bit of flat shading and then the plate above that is a more complex like it could be maybe uh, like the profile of a head uh, instead of just the eye so yeah I think um, it was just a nice way to start and I wanted to bring some of those techniques from the atelier uh, the Swedish Academy into the course if I could because I thought it was a little bit of a unique uh, a new, unique way to approach the course uh, and then of course we go through some uh, more uh, methods that you might have if you're doing portrait you might know like of the Loomis uh, Andrew Loomis yeah, method yeah. of drawing yeah. a head and I thought it would be good to bring those in as well because I kind of use a little bit of tools from Charles Bug learning in the atelier as well as like Andrew Loomis and looking at uh, other artists that are inspiring um, that I've included in the course as well to uh, to get you kind of warmed up and drawing uh, the fundamentals. And then it's a pretty big step up from going from the fundamentals to creating your own portrait. So, I mean, I think it's a good course that you can kind of do maybe the f first two lessons and then practice a bit and come back mm -hmm. and do the third and fourth lesson. I thought it was like a nice, nice thing to do. So it uh, could be a little frustrating going through the whole thing if you're just beginning drawing. Um, so that's what's so nice about the courses. Yeah, you can kind of pick it up again and again, look at the tools and stuff. Yeah, like that's one thing I definitely took away um, because, and you, you mentioned this in the course as well, like it's, you mentioned a lot about just the concept of time and not, you know, like repetition and also like take your time. It's not a case of like, although people have done it and you can do it where you can take each lesson, however quick it takes you and complete it. But, especially with the fundamentals that you teach and just even like, you know, to get to grips with the human face. And like you mentioned before, it's one of the, you know, considered one of the hardest things or one of the most, I guess, hard is probably like a, you know, a relative concept in terms of when it comes to being a creative, but it's definitely maybe one of the most scrutinized things wherever you create in terms of like the face and like you mentioned that the human form in, in general. Um, and it's cool because that like we just explained as well. Like the first few lessons you can kind of do in a loop almost until you get to like kind of uh, a level where you think, okay, I kind of got to grips with this now. I kind of understand this. And then the latter lessons are like, okay, now let's bring whatever you want to create to life. And even taking away the, um, this, the, the subject of a portrait, your painting methods, the way you kind of like, you know, use lighting and all sorts of stuff. That's, that's super useful in terms of anything. I've taken it to the stuff that I've done as well, because yeah, like it's the way you, um, from what I've observed, especially like watching you like teach the course and everything as well. It's like the, the, the almost kind of orchestra you have of, or the way they conduct like, you know, shape, lighting, color and all these kind of things. And then how you translate that into structured way to kind of understand it and grasp it. That's really cool. And one thing is small things, hard to miss or is easy, easy to overlook rather. But one thing you say as well is, I think this is the point where you kind of like, you got your sketch down, you kind of got your values down before you take into color. And you mentioned that this is something that we can kind of either fix or adjust in color. Like you always acknowledge that there's adjustments to be made throughout the entire process. It's not a case of like, you start with this and then you must stick within those confines and then it's finished. It's still being flexible to kind of like be able to take a step out, fix certain things or know how to kind of like troubleshoot almost 
um, and then get to kind of like your finished thing. Um, maybe this is another abstract kind of way of describing, but it's kind of like solving a Rubik's cube. But every time you change it, the colors switch every single second, mm. and then still trying to like kind of like get to that kind of like phase where okay, I've got I know where the colors are, and I fixed, I finished it, and then it's done. Um, but is uh, is this how you normally work in general anyway, or do you kind of like switch it up depending on the different things that you create? I think it was like what was so interesting in that the lessons three and four of the course is it was like really big struggle. I think you see a lot of me failing and and going back and trying to fix things. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of like uh, also like nice for someone taking the course to see um, what adjustments are being made uh, because not everything, not all the time, it's it's so fluid. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it goes a lot more smooth. But I think that portrait took ages, uh, months of like letting it sit for a little while and coming mm. back to it I, I mean it was something that i'd work on not all like full time but uh yeah it was a, a slow process but i think it's nice to kind of see the the thought process i have and what needs to be fixed um the so i think that's because that was a little bit more of a personal piece they usually mm. take quite a long time if i'm doing like a study or something i have a lot more like structured process mm -hmm. which would also be nice to like show um I think you get a little bit of that that process in the the second like the second lesson when I do like a study from a photo and try to like make it more mm. painterly. Uh, that's it's a lot more structured, like a, the line drawings and then the shadow and the light shapes. And then uh, it wasn't a color study, but it just uh, was uh, that was over maybe an hour, whereas this other portrait was over many hours. So I think uh, it's yeah, there's a depend depends on the piece. It mm. can. Definitely go a little haywire like the uh, the last one, but I think it's still still good to see and and what needs to be fixed. And I guess with Photoshop, you can always go back and yeah, adjust things. And you know, if you got the colors wrong, you can put a, mm -hmm. a like a color layer on and desaturate everything and check all your values and everything uh, and rework the values and come back to color later on. It's just uh, it's nice with that freedom. Yeah, for sure. And like, even as someone like studying or trying to figure something out, it's cool to see almost like a super in depth behind the scenes. Like you see the kind of like, you know, like you mentioned, like the little failures here and there, um, the little corrections and A, it just shows that because I mean, like, so do you ever get like frustrated when you kind of create stuff? Obviously it's kind of like maybe that's a rhetorical question because it's always a yes, I guess. Um, but like, does it ever get to the point where you kind of like not want to create what you want to create? Yeah, I think, yeah, definitely, like, I definitely get f uh, points where I get frustrated, but I know if I work on it long enough, yeah. I know I can make it look probably what I want it to look like, how I want it to look eventually. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a funny one. Like, sometimes, yeah, it's like, you've, if you've got a bad, bad structure, mm -hmm. if you believe in, like, the, the initial drawing and, and the idea, then I can kind of follow it through, even if it's not looking good. But, yeah, sometimes you get a failed piece and it just doesn't work. Yeah. Um, but then like um and then like tying it back in with the course it's almost like the structures that you put in place definitely help you with that as well because yeah if, if that's what you're falling into a you have the angle of like seeing how you navigate that in general anyway but then also as long as you trust in the process um it will kind of help you get out of it kind of thing um what would you say is the kind of like and maybe this is this is not a thing but is it like a common thing that people or that you you've observed either overlook when they come to making portraits or capturing likeness um, or just is a common mistake that you kind of see a lot of at least beginners maybe make um, maybe even some pros too. Yeah, maybe it's the the structure. I think maybe um, yeah, I, I guess uh, I like to see uh, sort of like structural lines and, and, and keeping it slowing things down as well, maybe mm -hmm. in the initial stages with the line work. It's something that I also have trouble doing. Um, and you kind of want to hop into values and shading very fast. Mm. So yeah, I think, I guess general advice is to, to slow down, but also try to keep, keep things structured. And uh, I notice uh, lining things up, like lining the eyes up and the nose, like you can draw your structural lines, like the top of the eyebrows and mm -hmm. like below the nose and the mouth and make sure everything's sort of, uh, 
level and not sort of tilted enough mm -hmm. uh, it's a really hard thing to do especially when the head is like tilted at different angles um yeah i think those things are things to think about um you can see it's really easy mistake to make hmm. and in terms of like looking at the finished result and looking at it as almost a hurt from a career perspective and a professional perspective is let's say you do this as a personal piece versus a professional piece or even like say for concept art like what kind of mindset because you mentioned that it's like you know your personal approach is different to professional approach for example um what kind of like ingredients or traits would you say are ones to keep an eye on more of when you say maybe making a portrait or following your workflow during a professional process making like say for example concept art um and then equally versus when you're working for yourself and working on a personal piece yeah uh for concept art i think uh simplification as well is really helpful for the drawing particularly on the face uh, I, I actually use a lot of like an ink brush in photoshop to, to do so like thumbnail sketches if i'm doing like thumbnail characters I keep the face sort of suggestive and like I might group the whole shadow shape of the eye as well as like the side of the nose, you mm -hmm. know, that whole shadow shape and just keep it simple. But, you know, you still understand the proportions and like the shadow of the below the nose. If I just like indicate that shadow and indicate the eye socket and the other eye socket, you start to build a face quite quickly. Um, I think that that's uh, also kind of cool to, to bring in uh, understanding the face, um, and being able to simplify it. Uh, it's been really helpful for for concepts. We do a lot of photo bashing, actually. So mm -hmm. um, at the moment, uh, it's a lot of a um, little bit of a combination. Like usually, I'll do my thumbnails and in, in a drawing because I, I like to capture that sort of feel and be really loose and not tie mm -hmm. myself down with photos. And then when I hop into something that's more uh, when we're sort of like finishing product, it could be a little bit of three D even, but mm -hmm. uh, some photo bashing and maybe even stretching the photo and painting over it and get it capturing a bit of a different feel. Obviously, uh, you probably don't want to like copy the photo directly or just leave it, um, uh, depending on the project, of course. Sure. But, um, yeah, say so altering it and being able to paint, but you still have sort of like an understanding. Like sometimes I'll get a, a photo and we'll like re want to relight it and understanding the light on that mm -hmm. photo and like being able to adjust it in Photoshop um, to match the rest of the character. So, yeah. Yeah, that, I guess like that was one of the things I was trying to get as well regarding, I guess, pipeline because a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of the, I guess, the industry standard pipeline is going to be the you know, photo bashing 3D using a base that's already been provided kind of thing. Um, and yeah, it's cool to hear that you kind of like, it, it doesn't sound like it's obstacle to kind of repurpose those into the way you want to work. Uh, am, I, am I right in assuming that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, I think it's it's helpful anyway. Like, if you, you can be good at photo bashing, I think it's just helpful to understand the, the drawing as well. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I've actually been going through a lot of 3D. So, like, I've been doing Pablo's course on ZBrush and nice. stuff. So, nice. that's, uh, yeah, really helpful to go through those and have, have those tools to be able to use uh, for, you know, sort of different equipment that yeah, you might yeah. put on a character. Um, yeah. Because you, I guess you've done, like, um, for the Atelier, you've done probably sculpting as well, right? We did a little bit. Uh, yeah. It was cool. We did a just a. It was actually only a two week. Uh, no, it was one week or two week. Two week uh -huh. course. We did it with uh, an artist called Max Pate. He was a lead a sculpture artist at Weta for a while. Um, nice. He worked on Lord of the Rings, but he was cool. He came over to Sweden and he brought all the uh, casts, like these head statues of the actors that played the uh, the hobbits. Wow. Uh, with him, so we was, did replicas of of those. Um, so the hobbits, yeah, I think it was, well, there was dwar I think it was the dwarves actually in, All right, in right. the movies, um, and yeah, he we did sort of like replicas of those in clay. It was a really cool course, Sick. Really awesome. So nice Lord of the Rings reference as well. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, how you how do you find three D then? Like, do you kind of like find yourself following the same kind of steps, but obviously just in this, you know, medium? Yeah, it's doing a little bit of like hard surface stuff. So I'm. Um, going like zbrush is pretty in a way it feels a bit traditional i think compared to yeah, like blender yeah. and maya and those um still learning the tools a little bit like i've learned um it's like knowing how to boolean and and cut out i'm trying to keep it as like organic as i can in yeah, my yeah, workflow yeah. Um, i don't really want to get into uh like making like a, a low poly like a game ready asset or anything sure, but, sure, um, sure. just being able to be able to 
I don't know, bring it into whatever, whether Blender can <laughs> handle such a dense model or if it's Unreal 5 or something to, to put it in. But um, yeah, I'm just trying to, I really think that 3D is really helpful in concept art. So I'm trying to mm. add, like add it to my, my tool set. So still a work in progress. And how are you finding 3D in general? Like, do you see that? Hey, this is something that definitely, like oh, you mentioned because more like uh, needs must kind of thing because it's like, again, part of work and stuff. But is this something that you kind of see almost like surfing, something you want to continue doing more often? And like, it's definitely going to be part of your workflow. Yeah, I think so. I think I just love the the freedom of the tool and like the, mm. yeah, there's just so much cool stuff you can do. It's kind of like, I feel like when I hop into ZBrush, it's like playing with Lego again as a kid. Mm. It's like, you got all these tools and what do you call it? Um, what are they called? Those little, um, uh, in your brush palette or your brush tools, there's, uh, I forgot what they call. There's all kinds of different shapes you can make boolean of that are like preset in the mm. in the software. Um, but this is just really it feels like it's it's so like a limitless possibilities of making cool stuff. So I, I don't know. Sometimes like I've tried picking up ZBrush a few times, and I get to a point where I kind of understand the tools and can sculpt yeah. a little bit, and then I f put it down for a year or so, and then forget about it. Uh, I think uh, at the moment I have a pretty strong sort of like photo bash drawing uh, pipe or like workflow that uh -huh. it, it works for me. So I think it's, if I have the time, I try to uh, do some ZBrush, but it's not really necessary. Just might think it's a nice, it could be a real big advantage to my work as well. So, And um, are you experimenting with any other things? Like I guess Unreal Engine, uh, MetaHumans almost, that, kind of, that seems like with the way you can like, upload your mesh I think now and you can literally put any face on there and you know have this high fidelity crazy thing they don't need to like kind of manipulate too much like have you had to yeah, play with that it's, much it's so too? cool uh, I've opened up metal humans I think I played with it a little bit yeah uh, unreal the same but just uh, just a tiny bit 3d coat I have a little bit of grasp on but, yeah um yeah I use blender a lot in uh, for work or I'm not doing so much environments these days I'm more of a character concept artist yeah but Previously, I was doing a lot of environments using uh, like Quixel Mega Scans and Blender, but uh, and 3D Coat. Um, I think Unreal Five is definitely something that could be worth learning. Definitely, as a, nice. such a powerful tool. Uh, uh, and Zebra, I'm just trying to stick to one at the moment sure, and really sure, focus sure, sure. on that instead of hopping yeah, around yeah, yeah. a little bit because you start to get confused. Um, I'll be how confused about you? Many are, you times. are you using are you using uh, Photoshop mainly or is using 3D? As well. um it, it flips um a, a lot of it is yeah. like yeah 3d for sure I, a lot recently yeah. it's been a lot of heavily 3d stuff like cook up the assets and then oh, cool. either bring it to photoshop or though i don't like really drawing in photoshop so it's more like mm -hmm. on the tablet or wherever else anything that kind of draws or gives me line work sometimes even um i've did a project where it was i try to imitate like it was sketched but it was purely 3d and just like messing with shaders and stuff um so that was interesting to like learning curve because sometimes you want to go for an aesthetic right um but at the same time you don't have to keep switching between things um so i kind of like and this is an advantage and a detriment at the same time i'm very like experimental and i do kind of hop around in things um but at the same time um for the same reasons as yourself, I'm trying to like limit it just because of time and, you know, like keeping a focus on certain things. And um, I'll have found useful where like if I'm tackling a certain project or a theme, I kind of like, although I'm always open to kind of like, you know, change it last minute or whatever, to kind of like give myself some rigid, like, you know, restrictions and parameters. So in case like, oh, this is only going to be done in X, Y, or Z software and then um, make it work, um, which, which is kind of cool. A bit like, what you mentioned before about like you know working maybe in traditional like plain air like there's certain limitations that you have to overcome with maybe you wouldn't if you had your different kind of environment um but then like yeah i'm always like keeping an eye out and happy to experiment like ue5 is something that i definitely i'm going to pick up way more often as the year progresses like it's becoming to the point where this is going to be like a serious thing i have to use going forward um and it's cool kind of like seeing how some of these tools kind of separate and then merge over time, then become new things. And um, you know, like, like Blender, like if you saw that 10, 15 years ago, it was no one would ever say that at that point in time, this is going to be the future of 3D softwares. Like it was always one of the big boys, um, but now yeah. Blender's the big boy. Um, I, I guess for concept art, maybe not for all the other stuff yet. Um, yeah. But then like even things like AI art, like that's really... Mm -hmm 
captured my imagination and working in that particular way, like working with words as opposed to your hands. Um, that that's that's super interesting, um, and brings out so many different thoughts as well. Um, because you know storytelling and I guess original concept art was through storytelling because you had words and is you know told orally or whatever, and it's kind of gone this weird full circle thing where yeah, you know like you're back to words again but creating imagery um have you played yeah. much with the ai art i haven't played with i've got uh invite to Midjourney. i just haven't t- had time uh, sure, just sure, recently sure, sure, sure. i just haven't well the thing is i have i definitely have i just haven't i hopped on discord and i was like ah, okay how does this work and then i was probably like oh, i'll just zbrush instead um but it's, it's yeah super interesting the, it's a wise choice though I've because seen. it's definitely if it, uh, rabbit hole is like a very easily thrown around phrase that is a legit rabbit hole like okay. it's almost like yeah. you pick up a game and you don't turn it off and you've wasted so much time um, and it depends if you w- wasted is like a relative word um, but I've found that yeah I will, I've definitely gone down many rabbit holes in mid journey <laughs> that's cool though I'll, no I'll definitely join join on that I'd love to love to give it a go I think it's so uh, yeah, it's such a cool way of like generating ideas and for um, sure, yeah. Man, like any, even if it's just like you use it as like a texture underlay or whatever, it's or overlay. Or it's just so cool, or just being able to paint over it slightly to yeah, get some really. I've seen some really unique stuff come from it, so it's just yeah, really interesting. Yeah, and it's cool. it's, it's it's cool, like because it's such an emerging thing. It's just like the beginning of this new wave of things, um, yeah. and. It's hard to kind of put your finger on what it is, because on one on one thing, like artists always will use it for their own needs. Um, so another thing, this is not even a tool for artists. It's not meant for artists. Mm-hmm. Um, it's meant to mimic artists almost. Um, and then some other thing, yeah, this is you know like this is definitely for artists. It's weird, like you kind of flip around a little bit, and it's just mm-hmm. it'll be cool how history sees this moment and where it progresses. A bit like you know we mentioned things like three D and photo bashing, and these things were considered taboo or abominations at one point um i'm sure mm, a lot of it was true. more like people just were experimenting and really figured it out and i think it was a lot of it just a few hot takes that kind of you know they became the headline so to speak um mm. but yeah it, it's a cool interesting thing that's happening right now um and speaking of things happening um just before i guess we wrap up like what can we look forward to from you going forward and what things are you excited about either personal projects or things you're working on next or just even yeah anything around the corner uh yeah the um i worked at a44 in new zealand and they're making a game called flintlock which is mm-hmm. looking really cool um I've, I've moved on to sledgehammer uh to a different company sledgehammer so i moved back to australia but um so i'm working on really cool projects with them as well so uh, yeah, I think that game you can look forward to, and I think that's out later in the year. So nice. Yeah, I think for personal work, um, I'll just be doing more portraits, and <laughs> hopefully, I like love to put up some more uh, uh, of my own personal character designs. Uh, I think there's there's one that I particularly like that I put up, and I just want to do like a series series of them. So which one? Oh, it was the um, uh, it's like a Harry Potter, Fantastic Fantastic Beast inspired. Um, Oh yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that's character yeah. that I did. Some stuff like more like that. That was pretty. Yeah. Oh, and Maybe just some like, more three D, three D heavy sure. stuff. Would be cool. That'd be it'd be cool to see how you like just just for me like observing just how you kind of integrate all these like you mentioned the ZBrush and all that kind of stuff. How you integrate into your workflow? I'm sure it's going to be cool. Um, but just to kind of see that almost almost in a nerdy way, like that would be cool just to kind of see. Um, yeah. and just one thing I want to point out about your work uh, as well is like. One thing I really like about it, I kind of mentioned it before, where you're more drawn into what you've made as opposed to the technical side of things. And even though like some you can see like a literally a pencil just sitting there, like you can clearly see that it's made in a particular way. But you're mesmerized by what you've created. Also, the variety, it's like they they don't look the same. It's your style, it's you, but they don't look like that, if that makes sense. Like, yeah, like yeah. each cool. piece, each character, each lightness is all unique in its own different way. Um, so yeah, man, I just wanted to make sure I made you hear that from my mouth. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. It's awesome. It's um, awesome to hear. any final words before you wrap up and I guess like any word to your students that have taken the course so far and we'll probably take it after hearing this and beyond as well. 
Oh, uh, yeah. It's just uh, so like really, really cool. I, th- I think I found it a um, big challenge to make the course. And I think it was a big challenge to see what people would think of the course. But so far, it's been really, really positive uh, and, and also so exciting seeing homework, especially. I, I get like some people are tagging me on Instagram and it's really fun to see. So please do that and I'll, I'll share your work as well. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I think that's uh, what I'll wrap up with because it's just been really, really cool. I'm really glad I, I followed through and, and made the course with you guys. I'm really happy with how it turned out. I agree. It's, a, it's an absolute gem. And guys, definitely check it out. The links are all below and everything. Um, but yeah, Daniel, thanks for jumping on. This was great chatting with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. It's been awesome. Thank you for having me on. A huge thanks to Daniel for joining me. And I can't wait to see what he's got cooking next. Learn from Daniel today by taking our course, Painting Portraits and join the rest of our students who've been dropping some amazing work from this course. The first lesson is free, and the full course is packed with knowledge. Hit the links to sign up, and to give Daniel a follow too. I've been your host, Aaron Danda. Till next time.